I want to start by uh, making a special acknowledgement this morning. Yesterday, Lachelle completed 14 years of incredible service to our church as our children's minister. That may not seem like a lot to some of you, but if you knew the characters that she has to deal with and work with, you could appreciate that even more. But we're really blessed to have her as a part of our staff. Paul, Pastor Paul is out of town this weekend. Uh, he went to perform the wedding ceremony of uh, Ruth Lewis's son, Ryan. He left me with the task of continuing his series in Acts with 30 verses. I can guarantee you that it'll take less than three hours for us to get through that. <laughs> After Pentecost, the message of the resurrection of Jesus Christ was spreading very rapidly throughout Jerusalem by way of spirit-empowered witnesses as they shared with the lost. <clears throat> Signs and wonders accompanied the preaching, and no one could deny that God was dealing in a new way with his ancient people. Well, such activity could hardly go unnoticed. Interestingly, the regular meeting place of this new Jerusalem church was in the temple at Solomon's Colonnade, where people had begun gathering after they heard of the lame man's healing. In verse 13 it reads, but none of the rest dared to associate with them. However, they held them in high esteem. This verse probably means that no hypocrite or unbeliever dared to join them. The case of Ananias and Sapphira frightened them too much. So the words, no one else, there literally means none of the rest, the rest meaning the lost. So in spite of the reluctance of some unsaved people to meet with the believers, more and more men and women came to trust the Lord and to join in with them, and their number increased greatly. It was a phenomenon of the early church. Well, miraculous signs confirm the word of God in the midst of this young church. It shows God's sovereignty towards his sanction towards the church, and it followed his, disciple, his uh, discipline of the church. Many people revealed not only their confidence in the disciples to heal, but it also confirmed their sense of superstition because they believed that it was Peter's shadow that would touch people that did the healing. The apostles were given divine power to heal and to exercise demons in the Lord's name, and this was something that he had promised them. But not everybody was happy with the success of the church. The religious establishment had opposed the ministry of, of Jesus and they had crucified him, and so the same approach that they had taken toward Jesus went out towards the apostles. And Jesus warned them, if they persecute me, they will also persecute you. In John 15, 20 says, they will put you out of the synagogues. Yes, the time is coming that whosoever kills you will think that they are offering God a service. So these words were beginning to be fulfilled. It's the edge-old conflict between the living truth and dead tradition. The new wine couldn't be put in old wineskins, and the new cloth could not be sewn onto the old, worn, and tattered garments. So there were four different responses to God's truth. The council attacked the, the truth. The high priest and his associates had three reasons why they arrested the apostles and took them to trial. Except this time it wasn't just one or two of them, it was all 12 of them. First, to begin with, Peter and John had not obeyed the official law of the nation to stop preaching in the name of Jesus Christ. They were guilty of defying the law. Second. The witness of the church was refuting the doctrines held by the Sadducees. 
that, the very, that proved the very existence that Jesus Christ was alive. And then thirdly, the religious leaders were full of envy and jealousy. It was a, such an indignation that this great success of these untrained, unauthorized men was growing so much. After all, the traditions of the fathers had not attracted such attention, had not gathered such a crowd or followers in such a short time. So it's amazing how envy can sometimes be hidden and disguised as defending the faith. Well, the apostles, they didn't resist arrest. They didn't form a protest. They quietly went along with the temple guard. And they actually spent a few hours in the local public jail. But during the night, the angel of the Lord set them free and told them to return to their witnessing in the temple. In the book of Acts, we find several instances where angels ministered as God cared for his people. The angels were, were servants who ministered to those of us who serve the Lord. The Sadducees didn't believe in angels, at least beyond up until this point. But the angels told them to continue their public proclamation in the full message of this new life. Or some uh, versions read all the words of this life. This is a little strange way of describing the gospel. But it's the first of three jail miracles that we find. So as Peter's, in Peter's deliverance, neither the guards nor the leaders knew that the prisoners had been liberated. So you might be tempted to smile as you picture the surprise on their face as they realized that their most important prisoners were gone. This verse is full of irony for three reasons. First of all, the guards were so carefully taking care of empty cells. Second of all, the frenzied leaders were deliberating as to what happened to these men who they had once held captive. And at the time that they were doing this deliberation, they got the news that the apostles were in the court preaching again. And as they gathered to judge them, prisoners that they didn't even have. Although they didn't get a full night's sleep, at daybreak, the apostles were already back evangelizing in the temple courts. The council had gone to great lengths to try to stop the miracles. And yet all they had done was increase the miracles. The captain and the jail officers carefully recaptured the officials. But they did it very carefully, very quietly, so that they didn't arouse anger in the populace and take the chance of being stoned. Sounds a little familiar, doesn't it? And they brought the apostles before the Sanhedrin for questioning. Well, the Sanhedrin was the supreme court of the land. They were the administrators who took care of internal affairs, foreign affairs, the taxes. They were in charge of a multitude of things. Most of them were Sadducees. They filled various political, social, and religious roles, including maintaining the temple in Jerusalem. Their high social status was reinforced by their priestly responsibilities, according to the Torah. They didn't believe in the resurrection. That's why they were sad, you see. <laughs> but all the priests were not Sadducees. Some of them were Pharisees. The Pharisees believed in the resurrection of the dead. And so even though they had vast differences in some areas, one thing that they all agreed upon was that they needed to maintain power and they needed to maintain their position. Well, what a contrast between the apostles and the council. The council was educated, ordained, and authorized, but they had no ministry of power. The apostles were just ordinary men, yet God's power was evident in their lives and at work amongst them. Well, the council was desperate to protect themselves and their dead traditions. The apostles, on the other hand, 
They were risking their lives to share the Word of God. So the dynamic new church was experiencing the new, and the dead council was defending the old. When the apostles came in, they boldly accused them of defying the law and causing trouble. But he would not, the high priest would not use the name of Jesus. Instead, he said, this name or this man's blood, lest speaking Jesus' name would defile his lips or bring down the wrath of God. So the use twice of the pronoun this underscores the high priest's reluctance to pronounce the name of Jesus. And it obviously showed his hatred towards Jesus Christ. Well, the response of Peter and the apostles about Jesus' resurrection must have infuriated the Sadducees. Yet it was the same message that Peter had preached before, that they had killed Jesus and that God had raised him from the dead and that they could have forgiveness of their sins if they would turn towards him in repentance. Well, the apostles were very well aware of their responsibilities. It says, we are witnesses of these things, these words, these sayings. Furthermore, the Holy Spirit was corroborating their testimony by supernaturally enabling them to preach with boldness and to perform miracles. The same spirit that was given to them is given to each and every believer in Christ. Paul in Romans 8.11 tells us, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who indwells you. Well, this really infuriated the leaders, and that should be expected. The leaders wanted to put the, the apostles to death. Their opposition followed the same pattern that they had demonstrated in their hostility toward Jesus Christ just a few weeks earlier. Characteristically, opposition tends to grow, as it did in this case. Look at how fast people nowadays are to jump on a bandwagon with various uh, agendas and feelings, how quickly they are to hitch their, themselves to that wagon. Well, here Peter reiterated the basic principle that had already been affirmed in chapter 4, 19. Christians are to obey the government unless it is a sin. There are times when it is appropriate to disobey, such in cases as doctors who are told if they don't perform abortion that they will lose their job. Or sometimes people are forced to take on insurance that uh, does something that, that they don't agree with. But even this hateful indictment was an admission that the church was interesting, was increasing in getting the job done. The high priest realized that if the apostles were right, then the Jewish leaders had been wrong in condemning Jesus. And if the apostles were correct, then the council was guilty of Jesus' blood. This trial, as this trial progressed, things kind of took a twist. The apostles became the judges, and the council became the accused. Well, the apostles affirmed the truth. They didn't change their convictions. They obeyed God and trusted Him to take care of the consequences. They could not serve two masters, and they had already made it real clear who, which side they were devoted to. If they had been diplomats instead of ambassadors, they could have pleased everyone and avoided a beating. But they stood firmly for the Lord, and God honored him, honored them for their courage and their faith. Neither did they change their message. Peter indicated that the leaders indicted the leaders for the death of Jesus Christ, and boldly affirmed once again that Jesus had been raised from the dead, and furthermore, that God had exalted him to heaven. Well, the work of the Holy Spirit in those days was evidence that Jesus had returned to heaven and had sent his Holy Spirit as he promised that he would. 
This did not please the Sadducees. That Jesus is God's right hand is a major theme in Scripture. The right hand, of course, is a place of honor, place of power, place of authority. Psalm 110 verse 1 is one of the basic prophecies that predicted this. And there are plenty of other references. In his second sermon, Peter had called Jesus the Prince of Life in Acts chapter 3, verse 15. Here he calls him the Prince and the Savior. That word prince means a pioneer, one who leads, the originator. The Sanhedrin was not interested in starting anything new. They weren't interested in pioneering anything. All they wanted to do was protect their vested interest and to keep things as they were. Well, as the pioneer of life, Jesus saves us and he leads us into exciting new experiences as we walk in the newness of life. There's always new trails for us to blaze. In Hebrews chapter 2, verse 10, God calls him the pioneer of their salvation. For our salvation experience must never become static. We should not be a parking lot. We should be a launching pad. It's not enough just to be born again, but we need to grow spiritually and to make progress in our work, in our walk. In Hebrews chapter 12 too, Jesus is called the pioneer or the author of life. The author of faith, which suggests that as he leads us into new experiences, it tests our faith and it also helps us to grow. One of the major themes in Hebrews is let us press on to maturity. We can't mature unless we follow Christ into new areas of faith and ministry. The title Savior was not new to the members of the council. They used that for physicians who saved people's lives or for philosophers who solved people's problems or statesmen who saved people from danger and war. It was even applied to emperors. But only Jesus Christ is the true and living Savior who rescues us from sin and death and judgment. Peter again called the nation to repentance and promised the gift of the Spirit that it would be given to all who obey him. This means to obey God's will, and to trust His Son. Well, God does not suggest that believers repent and believe. He commands it. Gamaliel avoided the truth. He was a venerated a Pharisee, a scholar, highly esteemed among the people. Paul was trained under him. He probably didn't want to see the Sadducees win any victories, though. It's a lot like our government right now. We have two very divided divisions who don't see things at all similar in some ways, don't want each other to get any credit or to, to succeed, but at the same time want to maintain their power and their position. So the Pharisees and the Sadducees were a lot like this. Well, Gamaliel... Uh, influenced the Sanhedrin not to oppose the apostles. Even though his counsel was dangerous and unwise, God used it to save the apostles from death. Gamaliel spoke not from sympathy for the church, but from insight into God's sovereign work on the earth. In spite of the fact that he used cool logic, Instead of overheated emotions, his approach was still wrong. Well, he gives two examples. He cites Thetis, who claimed to be somebody and had 400 insurrectionists who all of a sudden joined him. But when he was slain, his cause came to naught. And all who followed him dispersed, and nothing became of it. He also points out Judas of Galilee, who rose in the days of the census, drew away some people 
after him, had some followers. Josephus, uh, the first century historian, gave a full account of this movement, which led to the execution of Judas and spawned further rebellion. Does that also sound familiar? However, all of those who followed him scattered. So to begin with, Gamaliel also classifies Jesus along with these other two, which meant that he had already rejected the evidence. To him, Jesus of Nazareth was just another zealous Jew trying to set the nation free from Rome. With a clever twist of bad logic, Gamaliel convinced the, the council that there was really nothing to worry about. He said, I say to you, stay away from these men. Leave them alone. Stop harassing them. Stop persecuting them. Furthermore, he assumed that history repeats itself. He said, Theodos and Judas rebelled. They were subdued. Their followers scattered. Give these Galileans some time and they too will disband. And you'll never again hear about this Jesus of Nazareth. Well, he was mistaken on that idea because he thought that anything that wasn't of God must fail. So he said, if this plan is of men, then their actions will be overthrown. Or it would be losing popularity or momentum. Once people's curiosity was fulfilled, they would lose interest and it would fizzle out. It wouldn't last. So let the troublemakers go, be patient. But if this idea uh, turns out to be true, then as Mark Twain said, a lie runs around the world while truth is putting on its shoes. In the end, God's truth would be victorious. And if this is of God, you won't be able to overthrow them. Or else, you may even find yourself fighting against God. Well, success is no proof of truth. False cults rise faster than the church sometimes. The world is a battlefield between truth and error. It's an immortal combat. And oftentimes it seems like truth, I mean, uh, that the wrong is sitting on the throne. So how long would the council have to wait to see if this movement would survive? What test would they use to determine if it was successful? What is success? Well, no matter how you look at it, Gamaliel's wisdom was foolish. But his biggest mistake was his motive. He encouraged neutrality when what the council really needed was a, to face a life and death issue that demanded decision. Wait and see is actually not neutrality. It's a definite decision. When we face a serious matter of conscience, we had better examine the evidence and the consequences carefully, something that Gamaliel failed to do. Jesus made it clear that it's impossible to remain neutral towards him and his message. He said, if you're against me, uh, if you're not for me, you're against me. And the members of the council knew the words of Elijah when he said, how long will you waver between two opinions? It's significant that in Revelation chapter 21, verse 8, the first group named among those who will be sent to hell or the fearful, the people who knew the truth and were afraid to take a stand. Well, the church announced the truth. Part of the council wanted to kill the apostles, but Gamaliel's speech convinced them to temper their violence. So in a compromise, in a move to simply rather than just simply admonish the apostles, they suggested that the council have them flogged. So each of them was given 39 strokes in order to stop speaking in the name of Jesus Christ, lest something worse would happen. The flogging was evidently punishment 
to the apostles for their disobedience and their earlier prohibition. When people fail to deal with disagreements on the basis of principle and truth, they often resort to verbal or physical violence, sometimes both. The sad thing is that this violence often masquerades itself as patriotism or as religious zeal. When understanding fails, violence starts to take over, and people begin to destroy each other in the name of their nation or of their God. So how did the apostles respond to this illegal treatment from their nation's religious leaders? Well, in spite of the bloody, the bloody beating, they left the Sanhedrin rejoicing. Here again, the theme of joy is evident in the books of Acts. Early in the chapter, in chapter 2, Luke describes their progressive dinner. They were going from house to house, breaking bread. And it says they were eating together with joy. Later, Peter encouraged Christians to rejoice when they would participate in sufferings, sufferings on his behalf. The opposition of men meant the approval of God. And it was actually a privilege to suffer for his name. The apostles were honored to be suffering in disgrace for the name. Well, the Sanhedrin probably thought they had accomplished a great victory. They were probably congratulating each other and patting each other on the back for defending the faith. If anything, though, this persecution only made the apostles trust God more to grow in godliness and to seek power in their ministry. True believers are not quitters. The apostles had a commission to fulfill, and they intended to continue it as long as the Lord would enable them to. In Acts chapter 5, verse 42, we summarize the apostles' pattern for evangelism. It's an excellent pattern for us to, to follow as well. They began with witnessing daily. This meant that they took advantage of every witnessing opportunity that they came in path with, no matter where they were. Every Christian is a witness. Not every Christian is a good witness. Some of us are good witnesses. Some of us are bad witnesses. Everything that we do either draws people to Christ or it pushes people away. It's a good practice to start each day and ask the Lord for wisdom and grace that's needed to be loving witnesses for Christ for that day. A victorious church rejoices in God's working in spite of persecution. A victorious church is a joyful church. Will you do your part in making this a joyful church? Let's pray. Lord, help us to be honest and to reflect on where we are in our relationship with you. If we are not willing to and haven't realized the importance of taking sides and joining you and asking you to come into our life as your Savior and as the one who empowers us and that gives us your spirit to do everything that we need to do in life, and I pray that people that haven't made that decision would do that now. For those that have, pray that we would affirm our truth, affirm the truth that you are the Son of God, that you rose again and that you were placed, that if we place our faith and trust in you, that your spirit will be in us. We have to ask ourselves, do we attack the truth? Do we affirm the truth or do we avoid the truth? Or do we announce the truth? And I pray that we would be content not to be stalled in the parking lot, but to ask you to launch us into new experiences that test our faith and help us to grow. Ultimately, we all have to ask the question, are we drawing others to you 
Are we driving them away? I pray that as we answer that in our, each of our lives, that we would realize that you've given us the opportunity to share joy and to make the church victorious because of our faith and trust in you. For it's in your name we pray. Amen.